this month, we have been talking about the perfect gift. That gift was given to us by our amazing Heavenly Father. That He would love us so much that He would send His only Son to be born in Bethlehem to be for us a Savior. We looked the first week in December at the significance of this perfect gift. And we talked about how important that this perfect gift of peace would come for us. You and I, as sinners, are at war with God. Our sinfulness keeps us separated from God. But in his timing, at the right moment, he sent his only son to be our perfect peace. We'll even see that reiterated today out of Romans chapter 5. Then we talked about the perfect gift of joy. On that night when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, an angel of the Lord appeared with the heavenly host to these lowly shepherds who became the very first evangelists, the very first eyewitnesses of the birth of a Messiah. And the announcement, The announcement came with great anticipation of joy. We sing joy to the world to remember the joy that God brings us by giving us an opportunity to spend forever with him in heaven. Now this week we're going to talk about the perfect gift of hope. When we come together on Christmas morning, be reminded we're only going to have one service Christmas morning at 10 o'clock. So if you come at 11, we'll say hi as we're on our way out. But he brought us the gift of love, the perfect gift of love. Peace, joy, hope, and love. God's perfect gift through his son, Jesus. Now, normally we don't think of Romans chapter 5 as a great Christmas passage. But Romans chapter 5 practically houses all of these in one message. It talks about all of these aspects with the coming of Christ and what difference that it made to each one of us. God comes down to us through the incarnation and he provides hope. It is that hope that allows us to look forward to heaven. It is that hope that allows us to show up at a funeral and say, not goodbye, but so long till we meet again. It's that hope that gets us up when we have been knocked down time and time again. It's that hope that lets us know that God loves us and was going willing to go to great lengths to prove it to us. And so let me invite you to join with me to Romans chapter 5. I hope you brought your Bible this morning. If not, we've got it provided for you in the notes, the printout. We also will have it up on the screen as well. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We also obtained access through him by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also rejoice in our afflictions. Because we know that afflictions produce endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I want to talk this morning about the hope that never disappoints. When we talk about God's perfect gift of hope, it's what we need more than anything else. We recognize that we're in trouble. That's why we need a Savior. But the birth of Jesus gives us hope that we can have access to God. The birth of Jesus gives us hope that we can have access to God. That's the first thing I want us to discuss 
this morning. Look at verse 1 with me once again. Since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We also have obtained access through him by faith into this grace which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The first thing we see is that the birth of Jesus gives us a hope that we can have access to God. And you can have that hope this morning. That hope allows us to approach our lives differently than ever before. That hope changes everything because we are a people without hope if it were not for Christ, if it were not for God's activity. Our hope comes from being declared righteous by faith. And we've already talked about that, and it is a great theological principle that God imputes, that's the theological word, he imputes righteousness on us. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We cannot earn it. God takes the sin of mankind and puts it on his son on the cross of Calvary. And as a result of that, his righteousness is imputed on us. And therefore, we're not righteous because we deserve it. None of us deserve it. None of us. Now, I don't want this to shock you. I know it's getting close to Christmas. And I know that you better watch out. <laughs> but here's something you need to know clearly. You are a sinner. I said it. I, I, I stand by it. In fact, right now, look at your neighbor right in the eyeballs and say, I know you are a sinner. You know, you know why you can say that? Because Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned. Okay, you don't have to elaborate. <laughs> but all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you. It means me. It means your grandma. All of us have sinned. That's why there's a problem. Because God is holy. and We're not. The place where he dwells is holy and we're not. No sin can enter into heaven because it's the dwelling place of God. You see the problem? You see why we have a big problem here? God loves us so much that he's willing to fix our problem, not turn his back on our problem, not ignore our problem. I'm talking about remedying. The remedy for our problem is that he declared us righteous because his son, Jesus, took on your sin. If you want to know why the incarnation and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, you want to know why that's a big deal around Christmas time every year and throughout the year? Because it's because we can't get to heaven unless something happens with our sin. The Bible tells us if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means we have hope, and the hope is not built on us. The hope is not built on our consistency. The hope is not built on our ability to not have sin. The hope is built on Him. He imputed righteousness to us. He gave it to us. He put it on us. He declared us righteous by faith. And so our hope comes from being declared righteous by faith. But our hope also is manifested in the fact that Jesus brings peace with God. Now, we, we explored this in a lot more detail back on the first Sunday of December. And if you'd like to if you missed that one, it's, it's archived. You can go on demand, go to our website, and you can listen to that message about peace. But listen what he reminds the Romans to, about 10 chapters later in chapter 15 of the book of Romans. And again, Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will appear and the one who rises to rule the Gentiles and the Gentiles will hope in him. Now, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power 
of the Holy Spirit. Our hope is bolstered by the fact that we have access to God. And if it wasn't for the coming of Christ, if it wasn't for the incarnation, we wouldn't have that hope. But because he has come, because he was willing to take on our sin, because he lived a perfect life in order to be the perfect sacrifice for your sin and for my sin, now we have hope. Now we have hope. Our hope brings rejoicing in the future glory that will come from God. It isn't our glory. It isn't something we conjured up. It isn't something that we deserve. It is something, it's not something we earned. It was a gift from God, the perfect gift, the gift of hope. And it only comes through Jesus. Now, the second thing we notice out of this passage is that the birth of Jesus means that even in our difficulties, he is producing hope in us. Even in our difficulties. Now, look at verse 3, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Not only that, does he say, but we rejoice in our afflictions. Doesn't that seem like a conflict to you? How many of you just wake up every week, every morning going, man, I hope something lousy happens this day. I hope I go through some real difficult times. No, most of us don't do that. There's some strange people out there that do, but not most of us. And yet that's what he's saying. We rejoice in our afflictions. Now, why would we do that? We can rejoice in our afflictions because we know the end results. We can rejoice in the tough times, in the difficult times. Because if we've read the whole book, we know the end results. We know exactly what's going to do, what God's going to do. That's why we can rejoice. Not because we're going to have difficulty. Nobody is glad about difficulty. What we rejoice is knowing that God's going to do something about it. Now, some of you are here this morning, and you've had a rough year. I mean, it's winding down, and you've had a difficult year. You've gone through maybe COVID. You've gone through the loss of a loved one. Maybe you lost your job or lost your career. Maybe there's other losses that you are experiencing right now in this moment, and you're going, how in the world could anybody rejoice in all of that stuff? Well, the only way we can rejoice is to know that God is taking care of us. Those moments when we can't take another step, he's going to pick us up. Those moments where we don't know which way to turn, he's going to show up. And those moments when we don't know where we're going to spend eternity, we know we're going to go up. That just came to my head, by the way, and somebody needs to write that down because that needs to be in your notes. I'm just telling you, the reason we rejoice is not, not because of difficulties. We rejoice because we know what's going to take place. God's already promised. Now, notice the progression in verse 4 of the process God uses to produce hope. We don't go directly to hope. God uses a process. And so in verse 4, speaking of these afflictions, he says, or the end of verse 3, because we know that afflictions produce endurance. You cannot endure unless you have something to endure. And so afflictions, the difficulties in life, produce endurance. That's what we're being trained for. Now, most of you know and, and, and often come up and tell me uh, of how important it was for you to know about my football career in high school. It, it was a storied career uh, most of the time because I was telling stories that weren't true about it. And so the reality is if you play football in Texas in high school, you had to run track. I did not like track. There's not one event in track, field, either one, that I excelled at. 
I wasn't good at jumping. I wasn't good at running fast. I wasn't good at throwing heavy weights. I wasn't good at pole vaulting. I wasn't good at hurdling. Uh, there was just nothing good. But if you're going to play football next fall, this spring, you've got to run track. So for all of us that were terrible at every event that track meets had, we were all lumped into one thing, and we all got to do the same thing, and it's called cross country. Of all the events of track, I hate it the most. But because I couldn't do any of the other events, I got lumped in with all the other losers running field and track, which means that we had two routes. We had the Broyles route. The Broyles route was seven miles. It went by, you know, Larry Broyles' house and turned around and came back. Then there was the McLaren route. The McLaren route was the preferred route because it had more scenery. Uh, it was five miles. And so we, the McLaren route was always the choice. If we goofed off, it was the Broyles route, and we didn't like that. One day, some of us, I don't really remember who, really discovered that at a certain point of the McLaren route, you could cut through the woods and come out on the other side where everybody else was running around the end and coming back down, and you would cut off a mile of that hated McLaren route. And so some of the guys, and I don't know who instituted this, but we cut through. Now, we could have had an easy denial if we had ever been caught. Because we came back, we finished when everybody else finished. It was just a shorter route. The problem is to cut through that, to shorten it by a mile, you had to run through a bunch of briars. Briars are a horrible creation of God. They got thorns. We called them wait a minute bush. You walk by them and they go, wait a minute. And you have to pull it off. And our legs are bleeding. That's all right. We cut off on, nobody's going to know. They're going to know. Nobody's going to know. They're going to know. Because when we cut through, sitting on the road that we cut through to, just as we got out of those wooded areas with all the briars, was Coach Tally Wyndham. Coach Tally Wyndham was a football pro coach, but because of some sin he committed in life, he had to do cross country for all of us <laughs> knuckleheads. And he's in his little Toyota pickup. And he has the longest Texas draw you've ever heard. We come out of the, we come out, we're pulling out thorns out of our legs. We're bleeding. And we look up and there's Coach Tally Wyndham. He was the lineman coach. He was an All-American at ACC, Abilene Christian College. There was about four or five of us. And he said, what are you boys doing? Uh, we, we were, we were hunt. We we thought there was somebody hurt, and and we were we were hunting for them. Yeah, looks like you cut the butter. Won't y'all climb up in the back of the pickup? We thought, oh, okay, well at least we're riding. We're not running. He took us all the way back to the beginning. They said, y'all start over, and I'll be waiting for you with a big old Dr. Pepper for me. So that day, we ran nine miles. Here's what I know about long-distance running. One, hate it. For me to run a long distance today, something mean has got to be chasing me. <laughs> you people that run marathons and half marathons, all that stuff, you are sick. <laughs> but number two, here's what I know. You can't run a long distance until you run a lot, a lot of long distance. Mountain climbers know this. Every athlete knows this. The only way to produce... Endurance 
so that you can do the task you want to do is that you've got to go through the difficulty. You've got to go through the training. You've got to go through the affliction. Be careful of self-inflicted wounds, what we had. But I'm just saying that Paul understands that even in a spiritualized terminology. If you're going to endure all the fiery darts of the evil one, there's going to have to be some difficult times. And it's out of those difficulty that we get stronger and more dependent on God. And we build up our spiritual muscles so that we can endure. What does endurance do? Well, he says endurance produces proven character. Endurance produces proven character. Character is who we are in the dark. Character is what we didn't have cutting through on the McLaren route. Character is who you are when nobody else is around. And when we endure, when we don't give up, when we don't let this little difficulty stop us, when we genuinely discover endurance, then it shapes us as followers of Jesus. It produces proven character. You know what it means? Endurance means that God can trust us with his plan. Because he has desired to partner with us in reaching the world. And it's that endurance that we learn through affliction that is going to produce this proven character so that God knows he can give us bigger and bigger assignments because we've been tested and found faithful. Proven character, he says, produces hope. So see, we didn't get hope directly because of the afflictions. It was a process. The afflictions produce endurance. The endurance produces proven character. And the proven character, the fact that God is now willing to trust you, produces hope. Because you know God is with you. You know, you know God's never going to leave you. You know God has entrusted you with his plan. Now, the third thing we see out of this passage is that the birth of Jesus provides hope that does not disappoint. It does not disappoint. Look at verse 5. This hope will not disappoint us. He makes a clear point about making sure we understand what he's doing. Why? Because Jesus is the one making the difference in our lives. The reason the incarnation, the celebration of the flesh or the, the God becoming flesh, of him coming down, stepping out of heaven and being born as a baby in Bethlehem, the reason that matters is that he makes a difference in our lives. People should be able to know that as a result of your encounter with Christ, you are no longer the same. That you're different as a result of being a follower of Christ. That it matters that you choose to follow him on a daily basis, even when things get tough. He is the difference maker. And God knew that. God knew that. That's why he was willing to go the extra mile, willing to do everything to demonstrate his love for us, that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us when he didn't deserve death. That's why it makes a difference. That's why this is such an important time of the year. The hope that Jesus provides will never disappoint. God's never going to fail us. People around you, they're going to fail you. Family, they're, they're going to fail you. Those folks down at the workplace where you spend 40, 50 hours a week, they're going to fail you. But Jesus will never fail you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, we can depend on him. That's why we celebrate this. That's why there's great joy. That's why there's peace that comes from him. And that's why there is hope. 
because God's love that fills us to the brim comes by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, after the day of Pentecost, we find this in Luke's account in the book of Acts. He said, I'm not going to go back to the Father unless I leave you the Comforter in the King James. The Paraclete is in the Greek word language. And, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, look, I'm going to go and ascend back to the Father. He's going to be in session with the Father. He's going to be seated at the right hand. And, and one day he'll come back. We call that the second coming. One day he'll come back and gather his church. But he wouldn't leave us as a bunch of orphans. And so God, the Holy Spirit, now comes and dwells in us. As a follower of Christ, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will be there to guide you in all truth. That's what God promises us. That's why this is such a big deal. That's why we celebrate this time of the year. Because not only did God come to this earth, but now God comes to us via the Holy Spirit. And he dwells in us. You want to know why there's hope? You want to know why we can have great joy? You want to know why we can be at peace with God? Because he dwells in the heart of the believer. We might ask ourselves, well, what do we do from here? What's the next step? Where, where do we go from this moment? I, I understand these, these concepts that you're teaching, but what, what do I do about it? Well, the next step is to claim your hope of eternity because of God's perfect gift, the gift of hope. And he's offering that to each one of us this morning. How do you receive it? Well, the Bible says you must first acknowledge that you're a sinner. That's what Romans 3.23 is teaching us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Secondly, we need to understand that there are consequences of our sin. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That baby that was born in Bethlehem is the one that will cover our sin. He's the one that brings the gift of eternal life. How do we get that? Well, the Bible reveals if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means the moment you surrender to him as Lord, he forgives you of all your sin. Sin in the past, sin in the present, even sin in the future. All of that is taken on by Jesus the cross. And that and only that gives us opportunity to spend eternity with the Father because in that moment, He has covered our sin. In that moment, He has forgiven us, cleansed us from our sin. And today, today can be your day of salvation, the day that you are willing to set aside the sin of your life to forsake all others that you may have followed like idols and to surrender to him as Lord. In just a moment, our worship team is going to come back out and they're going to give us an opportunity, a, a time of commitment. And in that opportunity, maybe today is your day of salvation. Maybe today is the day you're willing to surrender to Jesus as Lord. I'm going to be down here at the front There'll be others standing here in the wings. And if you'd like someone to pray with you, we'll help you step by step of knowing for certain that you can have eternal life. You may want to just come to this altar on your own and pray before God. The beautiful thing is you can do that. We're simply here to help. So whatever your need is, right now you come. Let's stand as I pray for us during this time. Father, we do thank you 
that you have provided a way for us to have eternal life. You have provided a way for us to be forgiven by sending your only son, born in Bethlehem, to become the Savior of the world. In this, we rejoice. And our hope is fixed on your son Jesus and the provision he makes for us. We ask this in Jesus' name now. Amen.